This is the third part of our root building series, and today I'm going to show you how I built a small module representing some track on the Appalachian Mountains, specifically the Clinchfield Railroad, and a part of the main line near Elkhorn City. So let's get into it. OK, so why did I choose Clinchfield in particular? It has been the most popular railroad for train enthusiasts to model, particularly because it was a bridge route and passes through one of the most scenic and demanding regions in the eastern United States, and also had one little known characteristic. When most of the track was built, between 1905 and 1909, it was built to then very high standards indeed, and this made it one of the very few railroads able to grow and handle larger equipment without having to reduce grades, tighten curves in large tunnels, or replace light rail with heavier stock, where most railroads who had main lines developed at about the same time had to do most of those things. And more important, in my misspent youth, I managed to travel over the railroad many times and enjoyed cab rides and the hospitality of railroad staff, who were amused with my Aussie accent and my youthful exuberance. There were no security concerns in those days, which makes me very happy to have enjoyed my time on the clinch field. To get started, I need to create a baseboard for the project, and in this case it'll be two boards, or panels if you prefer, but before I do, I have some observations that may save you much frustration. When you start a route, you'll automatically get one board set up, and it will be a default 10 metre grid format. There's also a 5 metre grid format. I'm not going into the use of these different formats too deeply, but using a 5 metre grid can cause two possible issues. There are cases when I want 5 metre grids for detailed terrain areas, but only need a 10 metre grid for distant areas where that kind of detail isn't needed. This mix of grids can present a problem with the texturing. If a route's been worked on from the start with mixed grids, where possibly there will be a mix of 10 metre and 5 metre grid baseboards, the textures themselves align with the baseboards, and when this is changed to a 5 metre grid, this can mess up the texturing quite badly. I found this out the hard way on a route I was working on and had to delete and rebuild a whole section. The textures had lost their mapping and rotation and became single square blocks aligned along the board joints. Instead of having smooth and dithered textures, I had a checkerboard of the various textures I used. I have seen this even in the short time I've been building routes in TRS 2019. In this demonstration route, as it is quite small, I'm using 5 metre grids. So if you choose 5 metre grids and want a two board route, you need to add two 5 metre grid boards and delete the original 10 metre board that you started with. This means you won't get the texture mess between the two grid formats. I have tested TRS 2019 with a route that was totally 5 metre grid format and could not detect much frame rate difference between similar routes consisting of 10 metre grids. But bear in mind I have a very powerful PC here. Now let's lay down some track for the main line. I'll add a spur a little later. I want to position the river, which is called the Big Sandy River, a little north of Elkhorn City that sits on the Russell Fork. Now I have the basic riverbed roughed in, and I have some straight track which travels through a tunnel at that point, ready to continue the basic layout of the key features, which is including all the hills and mountains, the spur, a tunnel and two bridges. So let's move on. As I've shown how I do a basic setup of a river in a previous episode of Root Building, I'll skip that, but I have put down a basic colour for the riverbed. Now I'm going to shape the fall of the land from the track to the river, worn away from the remaining mountains over eons of time. I guess I should explain how the plateau tool works. Hot key letter P. As the cursor shows where it is located in the menu, it is basically this tool I use to make an elevation smoothly from one height to another. You can see it works just fine in the example shown here. How it works? Well, 
Whatever point you select with the mouse, left clicking, is the elevation or height setting that is selected. Then, you can match from high to low. Or as you'll see later, the low to high option when I work on changing the cuttings near the track to a slightly more gradual slope. Then it's time to start on the mountains on the other side of the track. This is typical of the geography from this point northward, which will see an O-trackage right up to and beyond Shelbyan. The Clinchfield right-of-way stops just a few miles north of Elkhorn City. Now you can see the settings I use to create realistic mountains without the unrealistic steep slopes I often see in many routes. Sensitivity is critical to avoid too fast the growth of the hillside. See here that setting a low sensitivity lets me retain control. Difficult to do with high sensitivity settings. I should mention I have an image on another screen to the left hand side, so I know it's fairly close to correct. You can see that forming the hills has resulted in covering the track in places. And this helps keep cuttings as realistic and without sheer cliffs, as they're not quite so common in this part of the Appalachians. But south of Elkhorn City, steep and magnificent cliffs and deep chasms are more common, and that I may cover another time. Having just set the elevation back to the track level, here I'm again using the Plateau tool. Coming up now is the tunnel track. What we're going to do now is replace the procedural track with some tunnel track, in this case the indigo tunnel object, and rather than go searching for it, I'll use my appropriate pick list, which is far more efficient than the content manager search. You might notice, in this case the tunnel is straight. Not only that, but it's parallel to the grid lines. The reason will become clear soon, but in essence, when I place the tunnel mouth and use the dig hole option to create an opening so the tunnel's visible right through, it's far easier, particularly with this style of tunnel portal, because you only need to make minor adjustments and the cliff behind the portal is easy to adjust, as you'll see later. That's not to say that every tunnel object makes this necessary. So now that I've actually laid the tunnel track, I can build the mountain over the top and adjust the tunnel track height once the mountain elevation is over the top of the tunnel portals themselves. And while I'm at it, I might just finish the rest of the mountain range on that side of the track. And then comes all the fiddling, to get exactly the right place to get the hole aligned. I must add I find the tunnel system in trains even more complicated than Dovetail's recent update version of their 64-bit train simulator 2019. Which is saying something. Depending on how effectively I've positioned the tunnel in the first instance, it can take anything from 10 to 20 minutes to get each portal set up correctly. And then, once you've cut the hole, using one of the dig hole tools, there is even more fiddling, and sometimes even adjustments of the position of the tunnel, with many other objects added, such as concrete slabs and concrete winds. Then it is necessary for copious use of the plateau tool, to get the whole thing reasonably cohesive. I did think about doing a tutorial just on tunnel portal installation, but after trying several different styles where every one of the tunnel portals had unique issues and problems, I decided to lay down and rest a while until the feeling went away. Maybe one day. Ugh. I won't bore you with the other tunnel in portal. Suffice to say, it all turns out okay in the end. Now we can add the spur onto our main line. You may realise the switch for the spur is on a grade and requires some careful adjustment to ensure both the spur and the main line match the same grade, at least until the spur is far enough away that it doesn't affect the alignment of the scenery elevation on the main line. Now I can start working on the mountains on the other side of the river. As well as some minor hills between the main line and the river south of the spur.
I'm going to use a plate deck bridge here as that is what the prototype used. Once again I use the pick list to find the right bridge. The pick list also comes in handy to find the right abutment. Once the abutment is in place, I need to insert a small section of track with no ballast, or the ballast that's on top of the abutment will just not look right. The other main transport object is the road on the other side of the river, which is a small part of the highway going up to the Chesapeake and Ohio Shelby Arner Yard. So I'll start at one end of the module and run it right up to the other end. Crossing the spur track near the bridge, it will eventually have a sharp curve to avoid a small hill just north of the spur. Now I'll move my attention to the river. And seeing as this clip took me about 9 minutes to do what it shows on the river, I have sped it up substantially, which limits how much I can say about the steps I'm taking. The three steps I am taking are 1. A basic rock texture along the bottom of the banks 2. A background rock texture along the banks up the top of the bank and 3. Some selected rock styles along the top edge of the bank in strategic positions. Now I'm finishing the basics of the river including adding some water, revising the stone texture on the bottom of the river and the spread of textures on the upper bank. The river, the track and the road are all calculated to be in the exact position on the prototype. However, for this particular rather smallish module, I did not use DEM data to get the elevations, so I manually copied the needed information from Google Earth and Street Maps. I hope I have it about right. I'm sure the root counters may pick some bits. The houses are not prototypical. I just put some in to give the impressions of the real houses in this area. Yes, there are some along this stretch in the time period depicted here. I'm giving my attention to one of the cuttings that is quite steep and logically this geographic area would result in rocks being visible in the embankment. This cutting is at the end of the existing part of the spur, not in the main line. I experimented here by using PBR textures exclusively on the cutting. In this clip I'm more or less covering the rest of the route with basic textures which acts as a background for any other textures I add on top. This lessens the risk of the underlying grid texture being seen or showing through lightly added textures. You might notice that there are two temporary boards added. One at each end. This was done to allow me to have some trains ready to enter the view when I do the cinematics at the end. They'll then be deleted before I upload the module to the download station. At this point I will finish the ground area around the track and as track comes with ballast I don't need to worry about that but note this particular track uses PBR textures for the ballast so the ground texture around it to work best needs to be a PBR texture also. So in this case I'll use a mud texture called PBR Mud Dry 1 Seasonal. Note, as with many other objects on this module, I will use seasonal versions as much as possible, including tracks, roads, trees and so on. As the area around Elkhorn City 
is officially a subtropical climate. However, it can still get cold enough for many varieties of trees to be deciduous. As this is once again a long clip, I've cut a lot of it out. After all, once you've seen how I do the groundwork, further viewing of this becomes redundant. Once I get to the spur, for variety, I am using a PBR texture matching the track ballast. To imply this work was done at a different time and with a much more haphazard spread of ballast. I'm also taking the opportunity of redoing cliffs on the spur. I was not happy with the original effort and it is important when root building not to be lazy. If it's not quite right, don't say, oh, that's close enough, because later, when you look at it again, it will always make you shudder if you have a good work ethic. Then I'll do some basic texturing of the hills and mountains, this time just to start, which will need refining later. Now I'll be adding in a creek running down the mountainside into the river. This has two purposes. Firstly, it adds a distinctly different feature to the hillside, and secondly, helps create the reason that a bridge was built at track level to cope with this creek's runoff during heavy storms. It could have been a culvert, but on the prototype was a bridge, perhaps due to an early wash away, I suspect. The bridge and creek are now complete, so let's run a passenger train right through the scene. Yes, I know this is not the right air and not the right locomotive, but it looks good. I'm not sure of the air I would build, but probably three CSX, I think. And now for our bonus sneak preview of the new Clinchfield Railroad route covering Elkhorn City to Johnson City. And yes, I am the first to agree it's early days yet. However, as you can see here, the route's been fully laid out in Trains TRS 2019. And not only includes all the ground boards required, but the mainline tracks have already been set up, along with the Elkhorn City yards. Several bridges are already installed, including the iconic Pool Point Bridge and basic scenery all the way from the northern tip of the route and south as far as the Hazy Railroad Spur. And to clarify the term basic scenery, this means ground textures, contours and several noteworthy buildings and bridges. Major infrastructures like tracks, rivers, tunnels, bridges and roads. Here I have overlaid a map showing the major elements that make up the Clinchfield Railroad. And while the map's not quite aligned with the real route position, it does show the overall route quite well. Here you can see the outline of the Elkhorn precinct, clearly established. The visible area, that is green, shows the area currently complete with all track. Infrastructure, like track and bridges, and the geographic features are fully developed. Quite a lot of infrastructure has been installed. The only major emissions in the area already started, being scenery of trees and shrubs, heaps of buildings are yet to be done, and sundry clutter in the hills and surrounds. Many side roads, some power lines, and some small villages along the line have yet to be included. In this image is Elkhorn City with the original town laid out. The station and the freight house are installed, the gas station is on the main highway, and the power lines are up. The streets on the oldest part of town are already laid out. As you can see in this overhead view, the Elkhorn City Yard is complete, including the Y and all yard areas both sides of the main line. Here are two views of the well-known highway bridge crossing over the top of the Y, and the service track for the tipples on the eastern side of the yard. Yes, they're all there, exactly as in the real clinch field. The building in the foreground represents the Elkhorn Yard office, long gone these days but this is just to remind me I have to get a realistic office to replace this poor facsimile. Here is another image of the new Elkhorn City Yard, with Big Sandy River running along on the western side. 
finally leading into my cinematic, one of the most photographed scenes in Elkhorn City history. And with that I'll leave you with this short cinematic of a visiting Norfolk and Western Coal Run, crossing the Big Sandy River over that notable Elkhorn City Bridge and heading off into the yard. If you've reached this point and have enjoyed the video, or even better have learned something, congratulations. I'd like to encourage you to hit that subscribe button below the video, and also don't forget to gong the bell next to the subscribe button, because that ensures you'll get notified when new tutorials are uploaded to my YouTube channel. So, back to the video. That's enough about building of the Clinchfield module this episode. There's not a lot more to do other than some perfect additions and some butter effects too. I've been watching another YouTube train splinter known as Approach Medium, and I highly recommend you have a look at his work. And now I'm going to take one of his ideas, which is a short cinematic of the final results of this module, along with a bit of a ramble on why I chose this particular module and any future plans of developing the full Clinchfield route. This first clip of a passenger train is using a built-in freeware version of the Norfolk Southern SD40-2 and internally, that is in the cab, this at least is not up to the same standard as the jointed rail version I recently reviewed, but I think the sound is okay, not great exactly. My reason for building this module, I built this to see how close to the prototype I could get, if there are any difficulties I'd not foreseen and how long it took. And given it's just short of one mile in length, and took about four hours to do, this gives me some indication of how long the actual route would take to develop, allowing the fact that some sections would be more complex than average, and more simpler. That is, limited track, no yards, little settlement, and minimal industry. And the route would be from Elkhorn City to Johnson City, a track distance of about 120 miles, which would be phase one of a complete route. The maths tells me I would need about 120 times the four hours taken so far, and that means 480 hours. But with extra features and research, it means adding an allowance of 50%, so at least 720 hours. Whereas going all the way to Spartanburg, which is the most mountainous part, would double that. No wonder no one has recently achieved that in any simulator so far as I know. However, for an estimate at least, let's assume I could invest, say, eight hours a week. That would equate to two years, Another way could be 2 hours a day, 14 hours a week, which would equate to 51 weeks, assuming that I'm also doing other things in my life, including these YouTube videos, living, eating, meeting family obligations and more. It is possibly a bit optimistic. To achieve this thing would probably mean releasing the mammoth route from phases. Maybe that would get me feedback too, but would also result in extra work fixing boats and responding to feedback and suggestions as well. Not sure there is a practical approach for this. Any suggestions or comments will be positively welcome. Alternative thinking included.
I hope you found this tutorial enjoyable and of benefit. If you have any thoughts to share, please add a comment below the video. I always check the comments and appreciate every one of them. But now, that's it from me. Hooroo!